with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Ravi Gupta, who uh, is currently the head of the Charles Red, or currently has, sits in the Charles Red Endowed Professor Chair of Religious Studies and is uh, in the department, uh, sorry, and is the department head of history, classics and religion at the U Utah State University. He earned undergraduate degrees in both applied mathematics and philosophy at Boise State University and an MA in religion and a doctor of philosophy in Hinduism from the University of Oxford. He is the author or editor of four books, including an abridged translation of the Bhagavad Purana with uh, Dr. Valpe here, which is also available on the back table. I highly recommend it. And is a permanent research fellow of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. So on that note, I do just want to make one more comment, which is that I have noticed in my own academic career that there is a direct proportional relationship between the length of time people have been in academia and the number of minutes they will go over their scheduled talk. So, <laughs> so for the sake of keeping things on track, I'm going to sit in the front row with my best karate smile on. Um, make sure I'll stick to it. Okay. Without any further ado, Dr. Cooper. So I want to, uh, do I need a mic? Yes. Oh, sorry. You definitely don't want to hear me. Is this good? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit more. Great. Okay, um, I want to say my thanks to all the organizers of the conference um, who in and um, Brahmatirtha Prabhu, Krishni Prabhu, and others who have worked so hard for the conference and invited me to come and speak today. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not a scientist or a historian of science, but um, unlike what um, Racharananda Jonathan Banks just said, um, theology is the queen of the sciences. And um, this is this is very well known in places like Oxford uh, and Cambridge. Um, uh, uh, while geology may be the king of the sciences, um, theology is the queen. And between Radha and Krishna, we know who runs Vrindavan. <laughs> Um, okay. So, so my, my talk will go 40 minutes, which is the time I have. Um, but I've been told that we have a full hour afterwards for discussion amongst all the panelists. So any questions, comments, thoughts, uh, responses you have, I would really, really love to hear them. Uh, I gave a, uh, an initial version of this talk a few years ago at this conference in 2019, I believe it was. Um, and since then, my thoughts on this have been gradually developing. It's taken a few years, but I've been doing further research. And now it's coming to a point where I think it's going to be a full published paper. Uh, but any one of my goals for myself is to get any thoughts or reactions that you might have. And I can use that to further improve before I publish it. Um, there's, of course, a lot more detail in the paper than I will be able to present here. Uh, so anyone who wants a fuller version of this, uh, you're welcome to ask me afterwards. Uh, besides my slides, which are rather minimal, you'll find I also have a handout um, that I will give you at the end of the talk. I prefer not now, otherwise people start reading the handout instead of listening to the talk. But the handout has the key ideas in it, plus key quotations from Srila Jiva Goswami uh, that may be useful uh, to follow along. So the title of the talk <clears throat> is, Can Empirical Observation Influence scriptural testimony and exploration through Jiva Goswami's Sarva Samvadini. Um, next slide, please. This paper explores the following questions. What is the relationship between scriptural authority and empirical knowledge in Chaitanya Vaishnav theology? In particular, what happens if revelation and empirical observation do not agree with each other? Can sensory perception influence the interpretation of scripture? 
These questions are of paramount importance to theistic traditions that rely on revelation, for they help determine a tradition's attitude towards experimentation, innovation, and scientific knowledge. The various schools of Vedanta philosophy, including Chaitanya Vaishnavism, agree that the most reliable means of acquiring valid knowledge, that is pramana, is shabda, namely verbal testimony, and in particular, shruti, the scriptural authority of the Vedas. The Vedas are regarded as being without human author, apodasheya, revealing knowledge about matters that are beyond the purview of the senses. In the words of Jiva Goswami, a 16th century Chaitanya Vaishnav theologian, verbal testimony can overrule sensory perception, pratyaksha, and logical inference, anumana, since both of these are susceptible to misapprehension. Thus, Shabda conveys ultimate truth, Jiva asserts in his Sarva Samvadini, whereas the other pramanas are reduced to mere shadows. At first glance, this appears to be a one-way street. <clears throat> Shabda can correct and overrule Pratyaksha, but Pratyaksha has no influence on our understanding of Shabda, which is eternal, self-evident, and divinely revealed. Empirical observation becomes, at best, a means to confirm the claims of scripture if it is not to be ignored altogether. A closer study of Jiva Goswami's Sarva Samvadini, however, reveals a much more nuanced and dynamic relationship between Shabda and Pratyaksha, where each actively influences the other. This paper will suggest that Jiva Goswami creates space for empirical knowledge to coexist with scriptural testimony and to a limited extent influence how we interpret scripture. But first, next slide, we ought to clarify some mat matters of method. This paper is an attempt at constructive theology, a rereading of an early Chaitanya Vaishnav author, Jiva Goswami, with the goal of ascertaining how his views are relevant to the concerns of contemporary practitioners, that's us. Jiva Goswami's writings are foundational for Chaitanya Vaishnavas. Indeed, taken together, the six Goswamis of Vrindavan created a corpus of Sanskrit literature that was regarded as definitive by the later tradition, even as later theologians elaborated and reinterpreted the Goswamis' views to address communal and political needs in their own times. My attempt here is rather limited. I wish to raise a single question in relation to a single theologian. What is the relationship between two widely accepted means of knowing, namely empirical observation, pratyaksha, and scriptural revelation, shabda? In particular, can the former guide, modify, or influence how we read the latter, shabda? What would be the parameters of such a rereading? These questions have obvious significance in a world that is shaped by the empiricist epistemologies of science. I am neither a historian of science nor a philosopher of science. Rather, my attempt here will be to plumb the spaces opened up by Jiva Goswami's Vedantic epistemology for a more robust notion of pratyaksha. As an attempt at constructive theology, this presentation will argue for a more dialogical relationship between the different pramanas, even if Shabda maintains the upper hand. Next slide. First, the problem. In his Sarva Samvadini, an appendix to his magnum opus, the Bhagavata Sandarbha, Jiva explains the power and preeminent position of Shabda. He asserts that Shabda can reveal knowledge that the other primary pramanas sensory perception and inference or reason cannot access. And on matters where the two do have some jurisdiction, Pratyaksha and Anuman, such as knowledge of the phenomenal world, Shabda can still overrule them. Jiva extensively critiques the absolute reliability of reason and sensory perception, critiques that I think most people would find reasonable and that need not engage us here. 
Jiva concludes that Shabda, with its divine provenance, remains the only independent Brahmana, whereas the others are, quote, reduced to shadow-like subordinates, unquote. This is a formidable armor for Shabda, no doubt giving pride of place to revelation in Chaitanya Vaishnava Vedanta. However, there are chinks in Shabda's armor, four in particular, that allow for entry for empirical observation. I will identify and examine these four chinks in succession. Next slide. Even if you go get bored from by the presentation, these images uh, are very beautiful. You can look at them. Uh, they're they're uh, they're from um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, uh, all in the public domain. Gorgeous illuminated manuscripts of the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, done uh, between the 16th, 15th, so the earliest 15th to about the 18th centuries. So the immediate question that arises is what constitutes Shabda? Since as Jiva points out, quote, everyone thinks his own opinion free from delusion. And that leaves us no way to ascertain the relative value of dif differing opinions. Unquote. The most important instance of Shabda, says Jiva, is the Vedas, generated from the Lord himself. But it is striking that Jiva then proceeds to include medical texts, Vaidya Shastra, for they too, he says, were written under the direction of the Supreme Lord. I quote, one may argue that they, medical texts, are unsanctioned because there is no evidence to prove their authority. But we say, no, we can accept these additional texts as scripture because they faithfully follow the Vedas. Jiva's choice of medical texts is both surprising and promising because medical science in Jiva's time and in ours is an area of knowledge that is fluid and prone to modification through empirical observation. Jiva is likely to have known this. In his study of Ayurveda, Dominic Wujastic points out <clears throat> that, quote, an old tradition of medical debate is very evident in the earliest Samhitas, medical texts, of Charaka and Sushruta, and that it continues well into the early modern period when authors such as Vireshwara in the 17th century Rajasthan attempted to mount a serious challenge to the foundational doctrines of classical medicine. So in other words, debate was going on in Jiva's time about what's appropriate forms of medicine and, and how medicine changes, knowledge changes. Um, Jiva would have been familiar with the Charaka Samhita and the Sushruta Samhita, ancient texts, which are foundational Sanskrit medical texts, and perhaps with the heterogeneous medical digest, Ayurveda Sokya of Todar Malla, Akbar's prime minister who worked closely with the Chaitanya Vaishnavas to secure ownership of the Govinda temple in Vrindavan. Indeed, given Jiva's sudden leap from the Vedas to medical texts, he seems to be arguing for a two-tiered understanding of Shabda. In the first tier are those texts that are apodasheya and thus unwavering in their authority, including both Shruti, the Vedas, and Smriti, which is the Puranas and Itihasas. In the second tier of Shabda Praman are those works that derive from trustworthy sources, but mundane sources, and follow the authority of the Vedas. Interestingly, Jiva uses the word Shastratya Vyavahara to describe medical texts, which means in common practice, they have the quality of Shastra. This opens up all kinds of interesting spaces in the realm of Shabda. Could the works of other scientific fields, such as engineering, mathematics, biology, and natural sciences, be included in the category of Shabda as reliable testimony of non-divine origin or even divine inspiration? Could the, could the broad societal acceptance of such disciplines serve to include them in the category of Shabda Pramana? rather than relegating them to the more suspect realm of Pratyaksha and Anuman? Charaka, the author of the medical, ancient medical texts, certainly thinks so when he includes within Shabda the testimony of medical experts who are learned in the science of classification. This technical recategorization, 
from uh, pratyaksha to shabda would have significant consequences because questioned, questions posed by scientific texts would then need to be resolved by theologians using the hermeneutics of shabda, that is assessing the relevant weight of different shastras, textual criticism, etc., rather than being dismissed as products of a subordinate and fallible pramana, such as pratyaksha or anuman. Next slide. This leads us to a subsequent question. What exactly is the domain and scope of each pramana? Jiva states that shabda is, quote, the most effective in understanding a subject that cannot be touched by the powers of the other pramanas. Whereas Pratyaksha's authority is in worldly matters. This view is not unique to Jiva. In the fifth sutra of the Vedanta Sutra, the word ashabdam is interpreted by most Vedantists as the world which can be known by means other than scripture. And yet, Jiva makes it clear that Shabda Praman cannot be confined to the non-material realm. He quotes approvingly from the 10th century Advaitan commentator, Vachaspati Mishra, I quote, nor is it reasonable to say that when scripture contradicts sense perception, it loses its authority, or else it must be understood in a figurative sense. No, this idea is unreasonable because scripture is self-evident authority, having no human author and being an awakener to knowledge from which all fear of fault has been dispelled. Scripture depends on no other evidence to yield its result, valid knowledge, unquote. Nevertheless, Shabda's autonomy fails to suffocate Pratyaksha's vitality for one important reason. Our ability to perceive and understand scripture depends on sensory perception. Thus, in ordinary situations, Jiva says, Pratyaksha retains its, its authority, and Shabda's veto power ought to be used only rarely. I quote, scripture does not defeat the ordinary authority of sense perception, Jiva says, for then scripture would have no cause and would not come into being. Rather, what scripture defeats is the absolute authority of sensory truth. Jiva defines ordinary authority, samvyavaharikam pramanyam, in strikingly broad terms. What's ordinary authority? He says it's sarvatrikam, everywhere or anytime. He then defines shastra as that which in particular cases, kvachit, overrules pratyaksha. And what are those particular cases? Jiva's examples are tamer than what one might expect. He speaks of someone who has been bitten by a snake, but the doctor pronounces that the poison has been removed from the patient's system, although the patient may still feel the pain. So we're back to medical examples again. Similarly, scripture states that a limb burned by fire can also be healed by the heat of fire a statement that seems to defy reason. In total, Jiva gives five examples of Shabda overruling other pramanas. And interestingly, all five are related to medical practice. This leads to a significant outcome. While Shabda may overrule one's initial empirical perception, the two means of knowing eventually become congruent. One would hope, for example, that the patient will eventually come to recognize the truth of the doctor's promise that the poison has been removed. Rather than truly overruling empirical observation then, Shabda seems to be working in concert with it. After all, Shabda is also knowledge that is based on the observations of reliable sources, such as doctors or the sages recorded in scripture. Indeed, the Charaka Samhita specifically emphasizes the need of all three pramanas to accurately diagnose a patient's condition while still elevating Shabda as the first among them. I quote from Charaka Samhita. This is a longer quote, but it's really interesting uh, because it argues for what Jiva Goswami seems to be demonstrating. Three indeed are the modes of ascertaining the nature of disease. They are author authoritative instruction, Shabda, direct observation, 
pratyaksha, and inference, anuman. It is only after examining a disease completely and from all aspects by means of the tripartite method of acquiring knowledge that a correct decision as regards the diagnosis is arrived at. The understanding of the total nature of a thing does not arise from a fragmentary knowledge of it. Out of this group of the three sources of knowledge, knowledge derived from authoritative instruction, Shabda, comes first. Thereafter, investigation proceeds by means of observation and inference. In the absence of previous information concerning a thing, Shabda, how can a man proceed to verify it by means of observation or inference? The discerning physician should correctly diagnose diseases by the, uh, by the aid of theoretical knowledge, Shabda, and by all means of direct observation and inference. Having considered all factors from all points of view, as far as is possible, the learned physician should thereafter formulate his opinion, first as regards to the nature of the disease and next as regards to the line of treatment." Unquote. The Sushruta Samhita, the other one, exemplifies this multifaceted medical epistemology in its exhaustive section on the treating of snake bites, Jiva's example which involves careful observation of the affected area, inferences about the type of snake that caused the poisoning, and textual knowledge of the different stages of poisoning. Um, just as an aside, this medical text is large. A, a whole section out of five, one whole section is snake bites. So you can tell how important they were in India uh, to, to figure that one out. Um, all, all the rest is in four, and then this one is just snake bites. Um, by carefully learning from the observations of sages, such as Jataka and Sushruta, that is Shabda, ordinary doctors can successfully diagnose disease and patients can rely on their diagnoses, even when it doesn't match their immediate experience. From this perspective, Shabda's overruling power doesn't seem so draconian after all. Next slide. Even if we accept Shabda's ability to overrule the other pramanas, how do we know that Shabda is reliable? What is the basis of Shabda's authority? Although the non-human and atemporal, that is divine origin of the Vedas, is no doubt important, Jiva does not begin here when he argues for the supremacy of Shabda. For he wants to make a broader point about the necessity of relying on trustworthy sources in order to gain any kind of knowledge. Indeed, Jiva points to Vaidusha Pratyaksha, the perceptions of the wise, as the basis or source of Shabda. The sages through whom we receive the scriptures are capable of directly seeing the truth. And thus, their Pratyaksha is our Shabda. And if we press just a bit further, how do we know that the scriptures are indeed perceptions of the wise and not the misapprehension of fools? Here, Jiva Goswami points to our ability to correctly apprehend reality. Shabda's truth is self-evident to human beings. And then he gives this example of self-evidence. This is um, the story of the tenth. Um, uh, it comes from from uh, Shankaracharya, actually, uh, where ten uh, uh, disciples, devotees, cross the river, and when they get to the other side, then uh, they decide to count to make sure that all ten of them are there. And a person volunteers, and he counts, and counts only nine, um, and they get worried, and so the next one counts, and they count nine as well. And after everyone counts, and everyone counts nine, they all start to cry and grieve for their lost 10th companion. And uh, then a wise person comes and says, the, the guru in the story comes and says, um, why are you crying? And when they explain, he says, you are the 10th to the one who's, who's crying, right? And that truth is self-evident. It requires no additional evidence or proof. It's immediately apparent. Um, so he gives this as an example. So how do we know that Shabda is reliable? Jiva's treatment of this question allows us to create a hermeneutical circle 
the observations of the wise become verbal testimony or shabda for worldly persons whose own capacity for perceiving truth allows them to recognize the veracity of the knowledge they receive. Transformed by that knowledge, such persons themselves become vaidusha, wise, and their words too can serve as reliable testimony for others. Vaidusha Pratyaksha allows access to Shabda Praman, which then transforms the learner's Pratyaksha, opening up the possibility of further Shabda. An important clarification. When Jiva says that perceptions of the wise are the source of scripture, he does not mean that such perceptions create scripture out of thin air, or that an unfettered mystical vision might produce an independent scriptural text. Rather, the perceptions of the wise are always mediated through existing scripture, particularly the Vedas, allowing us to access the Vedas and their meaning. Indeed, one does not have to look far from Jiva Goswami to find evidence of this hermeneutical circle at play in Chaitanya Vaishnavism. Jiva Goswami's uncle and the eldest of the six Goswamis, Sanatan Goswami, wrote a much beloved work called Brihad Bhagavatamrita. This work is framed as a conversation that occurs immediately after the Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavatam, when the King Parikshit has completed his seven day hearing of the Bhagavatam and is waiting for his imminent death, his mother Uttara runs up and asks him to convey the essence of the Bhagavatam for her benefit. That essence takes the shape of the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, spoken by Parikshit to Uttara, but of course written by Sanatan Goswami. The hermeneutical circle is at work here. The Bhagavata Purana is Apaurasheya, without human origin but nevertheless revealed to humans through Vaidusha Pratyaksha, the observations of the wise, particularly the sage Shukadeva Goswami. The Bhagavatam as the paradigmatic Shabda for Gaudiya Vaishnavas deeply transforms Sanatan Goswami, who then expresses his own vision, Vaidusha Pratyaksha, of that truth in the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, a work that is therefore new and eternal at the same time. The Brihad Bhagavatamrita then becomes Shabda for the followers of the Goswamis, who are themselves transformed by Sanatan's vision, and presumably becomes the source of Vaidusha Pratya, and, and presumably they, the followers, become sources of Vaidusha Pratyaksha. In the generation after Sanatan, one might look to the songs of Narottam Das Thakur as the continued turning of this hermeneutical circle, or what we might call parampara. And so once again, human observation has much more of a significant role to play in the origin and understanding of Shabda than we might have at first expected. Okay, next slide. Now we are less left with one final question and perhaps the toughest one. What happens when scripture plainly and obviously contradicts empirical observation? In other words, what do we do when Shabda seems utterly implausible. We are concerned here not with situations where scripture speaks of matters that are impossible to verify using empirical observation, that is, matters that are truly beyond sense perception, such as the existence of a non-material reality. That's an easier situation, where scripture offers knowledge that is otherwise unavailable to human beings. Rather, we are concerned here with instances when scripture speaks of things that can be known through the senses and then contradicts that sensory knowledge. Despite his statements of scriptural supremacy, Jiva is not in practice eager to do away with human perception as a reliable and straightforward means of knowing. In his examples of Shabda Pratyaksha conflicts, he leads us down a useful path, limited reinterpretation of scripture to resolve the conflict. Perhaps there are instances where one must accept a scriptural statement on faith, despite sensory observation to the contrary. But, but if there are such cases, Jiva Goswami does not give us any. Rather, all his examples lead us to reread scriptural statements in a way that aligns them with our own experience 
while still remaining faithful to the intent and the authority of the statements. Let's take a closer look at, the, at his examples. Sanskrit literary tradition has long categorized word meanings into three general types. The primary or state, straightforward meaning, like mukhya, the indirect or indicated meaning, lakshana, and the suggested meaning, goni or vyanjana. The straightforward sense of a word, as known by social convention, is the place to start in one's reading of a passage. But if the straightforward meaning is obstructed in some way, then one ought to propose an indirect meaning that is related to the straightforward meaning. Okay, an indirect meaning that is related to the straightforward meaning. The classic example is Gangayam Ghosha, the village on the Ganga. Since human settlements do not exist on rivers, we must supply something that is unstated in the sentence. The village is on the bank of the Ganga. The key point for our purposes is that the shift from the primary meaning to the indirect meaning is usually prompted by human experience, as in the case of villages on rivers. When applied to scripture, this has potentially far-reaching consequences. Jonathan Edelman has provided an excellent study of how this hermeneutical method can and has prompted a reinterpretation of scripture in the light of scientific knowledge. Following this long tradition of Sanskrit literary theory and Mimamsa hermeneutics, Jiva Goswami too does not shy away from reinterpreting scripture in light of conflicting empirical observation. He provides three statements from the Shatapata Brahmana as examples. The earth spoke, the waters spoke, and the stones float. And in each of these, it is empirical observation that prompts the reinterpretation of scripture in an indirect way. In the first two statements, which implausibly state that earth and water speak, Jiva suggests that the text is referring to the devas, the gods, who control these elements. In the case of stones floating, Jiva offers a functionalist explanation. Scripture here is praising the stones, which are used in sacrifice to press soma, uh, in order to increase their efficacy, as happened in the case of Rama's bridge to Lanka. Implicit in all of Jiva's interpretations is that when Shabda and Pratyaksha conflict, we ought to preserve the authority of both and reject neither. Okay. Um, this is not willy-nilly hermeneutics where um, you can just find any old meaning and ascribe it to scripture. Okay, I, I want to emphasize that. There's a whole method, there's a science behind this interpretation coming from Mimamsa and literary theory and Vaishnava hermeneutics as well that guides you as to what kind of reinterpretation is possible. So you don't end up saying that, you know, um, everything is allegory or everything is symbol or something of that nature, which Vaishnavas don't accept. Okay, next, please. We have examined here, this is the conclusion. We have examined here four challenging questions regarding Shabda. What counts as Shabda? What is Shabda's scope? How do we know that Shabda is reliable? And what happens when Shabda is implausible? Each of these questions opens up interesting and productive spaces for a fuller understanding and application of empirical observation, allowing Pratyaksha to not only coexist with Shabda, but to significantly influence how we understand Shabda. No doubt these spaces have important implications for the role of scientific study in relation to scripture. But more broadly, they create a holistic understanding of human knowledge that resists fundamentalism. The picture that emerges from our exploration of the pramanas is decidedly dialogical. Shabda and Pratyaksha learn from and spar with each other without either being thrown out of the conversation. Indeed, if Shabda is grounded in the testimony of the wise, then the wisdom born from careful observation of the world 
also asks to be admitted to the realm of Shabda. If scripture influences how we see our world, then sensory perception influences how we read scripture. If wisdom from scripture supports and refines our observations of the world, then wisdom gleaned from careful observation can support and refine our reading of scripture. Conversely, if scripture can overrule sensory perception, then perception can prompt a reinterpretation of scripture. And if scripture creates good human beings, leading them on the path to becoming wise, then the observations of the wise themselves form the basis of scripture. And so I suggest that we move from a steeply hierarchical ladder of pramanas to a more dialogical model, where Shabda is no doubt the senior partner in the conversation, carrying the gravitas of revelation. But human observation and reason are nevertheless consequential participants, taken seriously and never ignored or silenced. What would such a dialogical approach look like in practice? Drawing on Jiva's methods, as discussed above, we can begin with the following three things. One, we read scripture together with our knowledge of the world. We ask, what do we know about the world that might confirm or problematize our understanding of this passage in scripture? Conversely, when we observe the world, we see it through the eyes of scripture. How does scripture illuminate or problematize our understanding of the world? What interpretive framework does scripture offer us to view the world? <laughs> if scripture, uh, number two, okay, so that was the first suggestion. Number two, if scripture and empirical knowledge conflict, we do not shy away from the issue. Instead, we ask, how can we honor both? Can scripture or its commentarial tradition be understood in a way that reconciles the conflict? Conversely, will my observation of the world eventually make sense in light of scripture? Third, when we come across sources of knowledge outside Shruti and Smriti, such as wisdom in other religions or scientific knowledge, we are willing to take them seriously as conversation partners. We ask, are their sources of knowledge reliable in their respective areas of expertise and therefore examples of Vaidusha Pratyaksha? Do they follow the spirit of Shruti and Smriti? <clears throat> if so, what can I learn about my own tradition from studying these other sources of knowledge? In an ideal that is in a non-human world, every pramana would be perfect. Pratyaksha would be unimpeded by the limitations of the senses. Anumana would be free of fallacy and confusion. And Shabda would always come from reliable sources and be properly interpreted. But in our world, each pramana comes with its characteristic pitfalls that are well articulated by Jiva Goswami and other Vedanta philosophers. Empirical observation, Pratyaksha, is marred by human error and limited, uh, and the limited range of our senses. Reason is only as good as the empirical data on which it's founded. That is the premises of the argument. And even a priori reasoning delivers limited goods that are often confounded by fallacy, as the history of philosophy demonstrates. Verbal testimony, Shabda, is similarly riddled with potential issues, including deceptive sources, misinterpretation by the listener or reader, and the corruption of knowledge over time. Indeed, Krishna himself notes this challenge in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, when he tells Arjun that the knowledge he taught millennia ago was destroyed over time and so needed to be taught again. The Sanskrit commentarial tradition has long recognized the potential unreliability and instability of knowledge sources, including sacred texts. For example, the 13th century Vedanta philosopher Madhvacharya tells us in his treatise on the Mahabharata that this work, the Mahabharata, which is the conclusion of all the scriptures, is mostly in ruins. 
with passages that are interpolated and disordered. Jiva Goswami articulates perhaps the Jiva Goswami articulates perhaps the greatest challenge with verbal testimony, Shabda, when he points out that, quote, everyone thinks his own opinion free from delusion. It is precisely because of these pitfalls that each pramana needs to be both tested and supported by the others. Scripture can extend human knowledge beyond the confines of limited observation, revealing transcendent truth to careful readers and imploring us to honestly face the ethical and spiritual consequences of our reasoning. Conversely, claims to Shabda's status can be tested, debunked, or supported by empirical observation and sound reasoning in the ways that we have discussed in this paper. A fine example of this dialogical relationship between the pramanas appears in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita when Arjun asks Krishna to show his cosmic form that encompasses the entire universe in his body. Arjun has just heard about this cosmic aspect in previous chapters where Krishna described himself as the light of the sun and the moon, the taste of water, the life of all that lives, and the exemplar of all created beings. But Arjun wants to see it for himself, and Krishna obliges, giving him the necessary vision to see his universal form. Srila Prabhupada writes in his commentary, quote, Krishna also understands that Arjun wants to see the universal form to set a criterion. For in the future, there would be so many impostors who would pose themselves as incarnations of God. The people, therefore, should be careful. One who claims to be Krishna should be prepared to show his universal form to confirm his claim to the people, unquote. Here, empirical observation is employed to verify a claim of authority by Shabda. When someone claims to carry the weight of Shabda, then Pratyaksha can help us determine the authenticity of that claim. What makes this passage particularly striking is that Srila Prabhupada, like Jiva Goswami, repeatedly insists in his writings on the preeminence of Shabda over Pratyaksha. And yet here he allows, even requires readers to use their own senses to verify claims to divine revelation, even as Arjun did with Krishna, and thus create a strong foundation for authenticity, reliability, and faith. In a dialogical model of the pramanas, authenticity is multifaceted and composite. It is strengthened by standing on several pillars. For example, when we attempt to verify the reliability of a published article, we ask ourselves many questions. The qualifications of the author, the reliability of the publisher, the reception from the scholarly community, the stability of its results over time, and the degree to which the article's reasoning makes sense to the reader assuming a willingness to expend the necessary effort. So too, the authenticity of Shabda relies on a variety of criteria, all of which come together, samanvaya, to give us confidence in the source. These criteria are outlined by Jiva Goswami in his Tattva Sandarbha, when he argues for the reliability of the Bhagavatam as scripture, the qualifications of the author, the methods of its competition, the reception of the text by other Vaishnav scriptural traditions, and, as we have seen, its availability to perception and reason. We should note that for Chaitanya Vaishnavas, verifying revelation with one's own experience is a process, not an epiphany. And the process requires both steady devotional effort, sadhana, and the cultivation of character, achara along with Krishna's grace, Kripa. There seems to be no good reason to exclude reason and empirical perception from this already multifaceted gradual process. As with Jiva's medical examples, one would hope for the eventual congruence of the pramanas, the doctor's diagnosis, 
the patient's experience, and the authority of medical texts, all pointing to the same result, healing for the suffering patient. The Chaitanya Vaishnav tradition has an imperative for taking Pratyaksha seriously in its theology. Chaitanya Vaishnavas, unlike some other Indian traditions, are committed to a philosophical view that affirms the reality of the phenomenal world, largely because of the world's availability to sensory experience. The world is Krishna's energy, Shakti, and as such, it is real, eternal, and meaningful. Thus, it is essential that we do not eviscerate that commitment by allowing revelation to suffocate observation. Both can and should ex coexist in a position of mutual influence and conversation. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. That was an awful lot to digest, I think. <laughs> Um, and yes, a lot to digest and to question. I just want to, um, before we move on to the next speak, just to put that maybe into a little bit of a perspective. So I think that this talk really got at the heart of the issues that we're facing in this Sangha, as well as um, presented an overview of the hermeneutical methodologies by which they may be resolved. And as you mentioned at the end of your talk, this is also something of a process and not a revelation. Um, and so I would urge all of the guests to be patient with the process. <laughs>